the uh, the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's an honor to actually speak right after uh, such a successful vaccine uh, talk, um, which is, is, is really nice to see. Um, my background is a little bit different. So I, as I was already introduced, um, I work predominantly in machine learning on single cell biology um, and was involved in research and on SARS-CoV-2 specifically around working on the lung cell atlas. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a second. If you're interested in anything I have to say um, or would like to continue conversations, please don't hesitate to get in touch through any of the uh, methods that are kind of shown below. And I will kind of highlight a few of these again later. So to briefly give a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, an introduction to what single cell genomics is, uh, bulk genomics or bulk gene expression analysis has been frequently likened to uh, a smoothie where you kind of put all the compo um, components in and then can kind of only see the aggregated or average results, which you then taste. On the other hand, single cell genomics uh, is the equivalent of a fruit bowl there where you can investigate the individual components um, that go into this smoothie. Um, single cell genomics has only really become possible um, through the advent of microfluidics methods, which enable a very high throughput profiling of each single cell. And here you can see these droplets, which each should um, contain a single, uh, one single transcriptome. Um, and this has been awarded through Nature Methods of the Year 2013 and recently uh, 2019 multi-omics, uh, multimodal single cell analysis, um, as well as I believe last year, spatial single cell genomics now as well. Um, these methods, very large data sets to be generated. Uh, while this graph is from 2000, only up to 2017, now single cell data sets um, are up to 4 million cells, the largest ones. And um, what that means is that it's very difficult to analyze these data sets looking at cells individually, but you need high throughput pipelines which scale to very large computational, uh, with large computational power. Um, the ability to profile cells at such a large a throughput has enabled the, the human cell atlas targets or this human cell atlas goals to kind of want to try to profile every healthy cell in the human body to generate a reference for what the cells in our, uh, in our bodies do and what they look like uh, on a transcriptomic level. And where within the TICE lab and, and my, my team specifically has been involved in predominantly um, looking at the lung. Here, uh, prior uh, work we've done is specifically around the mouse lung atlas, looking at how kind of cells in the mouse lung uh, look from a pro profile from a transcriptomic perspective, uh, and also the first version of the human lung cell atlas, um, which from 2019 uh, we were involved in. Now, just to give you a little bit of uh, insight on what the, the lab typically does, um, we process uh, large analysis pipelines for, or we create large analysis pipelines as well as platforms for single cell RNA-seq data analysis and also other forms of single cell analysis. Um, we model this data, specifically trying to understand disease or drug perturbations uh, and predict the response using deep learning approaches. And what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today and which is the in the context of our COVID work as well, is on cross lab data integration. Um, and this is the integration of data sets from a lot of different uh, places generated by a lot of different people to try to get one consistent image of what single cell data from a particular organ looks like. Um, and the context I already mentioned before is for us, very importantly, the lung. Um, there are actually many single cell data sets available. And at the start of when we started our, our work on, on that I'm presenting today, we were kind of trying to ask, um, how can we build a consensus view of the human lung from all of these individually published single cell data sets? And these, the, general problem here is that we have batch effects uh, between individually generated data sets, which must be overcome. And this is a really nice review um, from the Satija lab um, in 2019, where they kind of show this problem is if you have two separate data sets, you need to look for shared correlation structure between the cells in these data sets. Use that shared correlation structure to map one batch or one data set on top of another to then get this batch removed representation of the cells. And once you have that batch removed representation, you can start querying um, which cells, for example, express a particular protein, uh, express a particular gene. And you know that what you're asking is not only the results of one particular view of, in this case, the human lung, but actually is consistent across uh, individual data sets and therefore is a much more robust um, way to understand which cell type might be expressing a particular gene. 
In our case, we did this on some of these uh, published lung data sets that I've shown you there um, as an early stage already last uh, a couple of years ago. And we could see that, for example, here, we're looking at the expression of team periodicis 2 uh, with relevance of which I'll, I'm sure you are aware, and I'll get into a little bit uh, further as well in a second. Um, and so then you can see, for example, uh, highlighted in this case are actually alveolar cells um, from the parenchyma of the lung uh, that express this particular, uh, particular gene. Now, coming from the lung cell atlas um, and having this consistent view, we thought how we could use this to address the pandemic as it was just starting. Um, early 2020, um, little was known about um, SARS-CoV-2 at the time. Um, and here is just kind of like a, an overview that was published in The Economist um, shortly after to um, describe different stages of the, the life cycle of this virus. Um, and while this shows specifically the mechanism of viral infection, replication, and then spread uh, across different cells, um, here you also kind of really so nicely see uh, several aspects that um, might determine disease pathogenesis and severity in the population. On the one hand, you have infection, uh, which is shown on the left here, and I'll get into it a little bit more. Um, on the other hand, you have viral replication and the successful viral replication that determines um, how well the virus can spread uh, within the human body. And then, of course, it's also the immune response, something I'm not going to go into uh, further in the rest of my talk, which is actually a very, very crucial uh, component, of course, to that determine disease severity, how the immune response. That's, there's been a lot more published on that um, since uh, the study that we performed here. So specifically focusing only on viral infection, it was reported fairly early that um, the receptor ACE2 was involved in, uh, or actually this already from SARS-1, um, in enabling viral entry of, of the virion into the cell. Um, and it was actually shown shortly after, uh, already quite early, that uh, blocking ACE2 and TMPRSS2 blocks a viral entry by a clinically proven protease inhibitor. And there were other studies on, for example, soluble ACE2 hindering, um, uh, given to hinder viral infection, and they're potentially giving an avenue to, to combat this disease from a uh, non-preventive uh, measure, but rather from a therapeutic approach as well. So in the beginning of the pandemic, this is what we're talking about uh, January 2020, there were a lot of open questions. Um, it was reported already very early in, in January that um, ACE2 is expressed in a subset um, of type 2 alveolar cells in the lung um, from a small scale study. Um, and this is kind of was used as, a, as an indication, we thought, to see which cells actually need to be targeted uh, or are targeted by the virus so that we can understand which cells might need to be targeted by particular therapeutics as well. So the open questions that were there at the time was about um, which cell types play a key role, um, alveolar type 2 cells being one of those options, um, in both transmission, uh, but also pathogenesis for the individual. Um, there were a lot of open questions on how uh, the severity, disease severity is spread across the population. Um, and we were asked, we were wondering whether gene expression differences between individuals might contribute to that um, and how these gene expression differences relate to population covariates such as age, sex, and smoking status. Um, the study that I'm about to present uh, is really one, uh, the third in a row of three studies which were performed by the Human uh, Cell Atlas Lung Biological Network. Um, the first couple were specifically focused on looking at where ACE2, or where the viral entry factors, in this case ACE2 and TMPRSS2, um, are expressed within the airways and the nose. And then this was also looked at in non-human primates um, to see where, uh, and in follow-up studies, um, to show specifically that uh, non-human primates are a good model organism to study further um, the effects that might exist on humans. So what we did to further the investigation of like where in which cell types uh, might be uh, affected um, in or might play a role in transmission and pathogenesis, we looked at co-expression of these viral entry factors. Uh, and very early, it was already known that kind of ACE2 and TMPRSS2, a, a protease so was required to enter the cell. And there were a couple of alternative proteases, such as cathepsin L, which was also reported as, as playing a minor role, potentially in SARS-CoV-1. Um, and now we know also of, of furins uh, and other proteases that are able to facilitate entry. Um, and we can show, we can see, like, after gathering 
um, over 4 million cells from 700 uh, from over 700 samples across 25 tissues, that there are particular cell types uh, in particular tissues which co-express the entry factors and thereby uh, are likely sites, um, likely cell types of, of that are involved in this pathogenesis. Um, specifically, you can kind of see next to the expected lung epithelial cells, both alveolar type 2, but also alveolar type 1 and basal cells, which co-express uh, these entry factors uh, in, in either one of these combinations. You also had non-lung cells, such as proximal tubule cells in the kidney over here, um, brain oligodendrocytes, which happen to uh, co-express these factors, um, as well as epithelial cells in the olfactory epithelium, um, and so forth. And so this gave a first hypothesis over how, where, which cell types across the human body might be involved in either primary or secondary infection. They correlated rather well um, with reports later um, for hospitalized cases um, of kind of secondary infection sites as well. But what we really wanted to understand now is to dive deeper into the particular um, lung and airways, uh, the site of the most dominant site of primary infection, which makes sense given that it is a, an infectious disease. And for that, um, to do a more deep dive analysis of this, it's crucial to have uh, much more data than we actually did have on the lung. Um, these 4 million cells were distributed across a lot of organs. And at the time, we only had a couple hundred thousand in the, in the lung that were published from published studies. And this is where the Lung Cell Atlas Biological Network really came together. Um, these were investigators uh, from across the globe, um, specifically uh, Europe, US, um, Eastern Asia, and Australia who had all previously been working in single cell uh, RNA-seq and the lung. Um, and everyone wanted to contribute to this uh, this effort to try to answer uh, some of the questions that we might be able to um, pose of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so what we did is we collected uh, data sets from each of these contributors. Um, this is like, I really want to highlight the involvement of Lisa Sikama here, who was doing a lot of, uh, from the TICE lab as well, who was doing a lot of the processing. Uh, we uh, we uh, got 31 data sets, of which 24 were actually unpublished, of healthy human data, uh, healthy human donors. And these were from individuals who were supported uh, across uh, consortia, um, across funding agencies, and so that we were able to, in the end, um, gather the largest single cell data set of the human lung and airways. Now, because 24 of these data sets were unpublished, uh, we did not just get the entire data set um, because I guess, you know, trust doesn't quite go that far. Um, but we actually only needed three genes, ACE2, TEMPRS2, uh, TMPRSS2, and Cathepsin L um, to, uh, for our analysis to assess where these entry factors of SARS-CoV-2 were distributed across um, the cells. Now, because each individual, not all data sets are, are annotated in the same way. Uh, somebody might call a particular cell a ciliated cell, while somebody else might call this a multiciliated cell. And these differences in how people call particular cells complicate our analysis, which has to be done on a cell type level. We had to harmonize these cell type labels. And we did this by a preliminary cell ontology to try to map, okay, we understand these is an epithelial cell, um, which is a subset of which is an airway epithelial cell, basal cells, and there's different states there. And so this was done through expert curation to map all, um, and harmonize all of these labels um, to further our analysis. And together, that brought us the first single cell meta-analysis that has been done to date, um, which is an analysis of independent data sets without integrating these. And we couldn't integrate given that we didn't have the full uh, genes gene set. Here, you can see uh, the compositions of these data sets. So uh, in different colors, you see the different cell states or cell types that were present in the data. And these are there's a very clear uh, structure um, in cells that are in the airway um, samples, samples from which had whole lung representation, some of these being, for example, fetal whole lung, um, or just samples which are um, explant, donor explants, uh, which kind of have cells from across the lung. Um, others have kind of more immune enriched parenchymal cells, or you have epithelial enriched parenchymal cells, which are particularly enriched by pre -process, uh, by processing or experimental uh, design considerations. And so all of the, there's actually a lot of variability which we had in this um, across these donors, because this, you must remember that this is not one controlled study, but instead these are 32 studies which are aggregated. Um, and we have rejected donor transplants in there. We have biopsies, brushes, um, 
bronchial alveolar lavage samples, um, and this all creates a huge amount of heterogeneity. So in order to still do some analysis, we, we cannot compare the compositions because that's dependent on the sample type. What we can do is we can look at the gene expression. And so here we fit a uh, generalized linear model, specifically looking um, at modeling how age, sex, and smoking status affects the expression of these genes, uh, which might give us some inf indication of potential differences in infectivity uh, across the population. Or your, yeah. Um, and what you can see here in different colors are the results of this for the three genes, ACE2 being uh, the receptor and TMPRSS2 uh, TMPR and cathepsinel being the two associated proteases that enable vir uh, viral entry. And a bar towards the right uh, shows an, a positive uh, effect size with, like, some, for example, age. Um, in males higher than in females, or in smokers uh, higher than in non-smokers. Um, we have to be particularly careful with this analysis because this analysis is done on the cellular level, while actually all of the annotations and age, sex, and smoking status are on the donor level. And therefore, to ensure that our results were robust, we held out individual data sets to assess whether our effects were still there. And if uh, any particular effect was dependent on the inclusion of one data set, we didn't call this a robust effect. We call this instead uh, an indication. And so what we find is that we found robust trends of elevated ACE2 expression with age in alveolar type 2 cells. Um, in males, also in secretory alveolar type 1 and alveolar type 2 cells, and in smokers um, in the airway epithelium more. Interestingly, we also found decreased ACE2 expression in smokers in 82 cells, which we can't fully explain. Uh, furthermore, we have um, indications which are dependent on holding out of one particular data set, which basically are no longer there when you held out a particular data set um, with ACE2 increases in age in multiciliated cells and in males in multiciliated cells. And the reason why uh, we found these both in multiciliated cells is because one particular data set had a lot of multiciliated cells. Um, so without this data set, we didn't have the power, we thought. Particularly interesting here are cases where we find upregulation or increased expression rather than upregulation in, for example, males here in multi-aciliated cells of both uh, the receptor, ACE2, and an associated protease. Um, or, for example, in AT2 cells um, in, with, with age. So to summarize what we have found, uh, or some of the, the aspects of this paper, is that we found that um, key so secretory cells in the nasal epithelium are likely involved in transmission. Uh, these are specifically goblet um, cells in the nasal epithelium, but also secretory cells in the upper um, airways. Also, uh, gut enterocytes might be involved in transmission. Um, and there have been individual reports um, from, for example, Hong Kong showing that uh, potentially um, transmission does also move not only through uh, breathing in and out, but also through other methods. Uh, pathogenesis, uh, we have likely involvement of AT2 cells, uh, but also nasal, epithelium cell, uh, nasal epithelial cells, as well as cells in other organs, such as the heart and the kidney. Um, then we find key associations with ACE2 expression of age, uh, with age, sex, and smoking status, um, which require further validation to assess how much of this actually affects um, disease severity or not. Uh, and finally, I'd really like to thank all of the uh, huge amount of contributors to this study, um, highlighting specifically uh, Christoph Moos from the Regev Lab at the Broad Institute, who is my uh, co-coordinator of this particular. A lot of the figures come from um, Anna and Leslie, uh, graphic designers at the Broad, who, who did a fantastic job, um, and Lisa, who greatly helped, especially with